Could the town clerk call the roll, please? Chairman Swift Kayada. Here. Councilor Backer. Present. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Lynch. Present. Councilor Mould. Councilor Roberts. Present. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, reports and correspondence. Are there any counselors who would like to report on any meetings or any comments? Councilor Roberts. No meetings, but basically a request to the town manager. Um, there was an article in the paper, I believe it was yesterday, and there were some other news articles earlier, about a, fi a volunteer firefighter in Massachusetts. There was some question about what benefits he got or should have gotten and everything else. And I would just like to have the manager, if he wouldn't mind, uh, check to see exactly what benefits our firefighters would receive in the event of uh, injury or loss of life, uh, and how it compares with other communities in, around us, just to make sure that we are adequate, adequately covering our volunteer uh, firefighters. And I take it you mean on the job, on injury the job. or Correct. loss of life on the job? Correct. Okay, thank you. I see the manager's writing that down. Councilor Backer. I attended last month's uh, meeting of the planning board in keeping with the council's commitment to try to attend each of the various boards and commission meetings um, over the course of the year. And I just need to emphasize, you know, how impressed I was with how committed all of the members of the planning board um, are to really struggling to do the right thing with very difficult issues. Um, and there was, a, there was a difficult issue um, last month. There was a question of to strictly apply the ordinance and re, uh, end up with a result that really would have been harsh and perhaps unjust or provide a bit more flexible reading of the ordinance and come to what everybody sensed was really the right result. Um, and to the extent that anybody in the community has any doubts about how committed all of the volunteer members of the various boards and committees are, um, I would encourage anyone to uh, sit in um, on any of those meetings, and it's really quite impressive. Thank you very much. Other reports or correspondence? <laughs> I couldn't tell if Councillor Lynch was going to speak or not. Well, Did you have a, some, a comment? I'm assuming that the manager or someone will comment on how well the election. No one else did. I was ready. Well, so I, 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 that's on my list, too, I was so just go going to, to um, just recognize all of the, um, not just the town um, municipal staff, but all of the additional people who worked to make the election so smooth and it. It really did run very smoothly. There was a long line for the first hour or so of the day. The rest of the day um, was very quiet because so much of the town voted by absentee ballot, but everyone did a superb job, and I just want to make sure that someone mentioned it. <laughs> thank you very much. I was going to thank Deborah Cabana, our town clerk, for um, her extraordinary efforts. I understand there was very high turnout, and I know there were just bazillions of uh, absentee ballots that came in before the election day even started and I want to thank you very much because I know how hard you and all your staff worked as well as other people who got pressed into service before and during the election so thank you um, I would also like to mention uh, for those for people who may not know that uh, one of our counselors former counselors John McGinty has resigned for personal reasons and I just wanted to thank Mr. McGinty for his years of service to the town Town manager's report? Yes, uh, thank you. I want to join in uh, mentioning uh, the election and uh, you know all of the staff here at the office and the, the run-up to the election. Uh, we had over 50% of the individuals took, took opportunity of early voting 
uh, used to be called absentee, the, 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 the vote, the name needs to be changed. Uh, about over 35, about 3,500 voters voted absentee, and that was a considerable uh, work for the staff. It was also a good thing to see so many folks coming in and, and availing them, themselves of that opportunity. Uh, this was Deborah's first major election here in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, she really was a great leader uh, in seeing that uh, the process worked well, that it was that it was very fair, and uh, working with all the different departments that, you know, the school department. Uh, were you going to mention anything? You're doing a wonderful <laughs> job. Oh, uh, the school department, you know, helped out by making the, the, the gym floor was under construction. They got it pieced together enough so that we could cover it. That was really took uh, a lot of effort on their part, and it's very much appreciated. They also didn't have high school students in that day, which, which we really appreciated because we didn't have the traffic and parking issues that we've had for other elections. Uh, the police department was extremely helpful. Even this time, we didn't talk about security beforehand, but the fire department went through and made sure that there wasn't anything in the election place that there wasn't supposed to be. Uh, the public works are very helpful setting up the, the custodial staff as well. Uh, at the high school. It was really a thing that, you know, nearly in the library even pitched in in different ways of having information there that we could have at the town hall, and I appreciate Deborah's efforts as well as everyone else. I also, I'd like to make a rather political statement uh, in that I, I really appreciate the citizens' vote here in Cape Elizabeth on the tax cap issue as well as the ratification of the debt. Uh, the margin here in Cape Elizabeth was 70-30 uh, against the tax cap, and uh, while I know you know, no one likes to pay taxes. It was it was good to see that the support for the school department and for the municipal activities in recognizing that there is some value in uh, in uh, the, the payments that are made. And I think everyone saw just how difficult the, the Pulaski thing uh, would have been. Uh, you know, everyone can have the different viewpoints. You know, as I said earlier, we represent all of the, all of the voters, no matter what their opinion is on that issue. But it was it was very gratifying to see their vote and to know that even with that vote that they they don't expect us to spend money uh, unwisely and you know that they want the restraints in place so i was really pleased to see that uh thank you madam chair certainly um if i if i could add i um i soon we forget about the tax cap but uh, i also wanted to echo mike's comments and in particular uh thank once again the tax cap task force which was a group of a bipartisan group of citizens that worked very hard from last spring right up until uh, the month before the election to put together factual information for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth so that they would have all the facts that they uh, might need when they were trying to make their decisions either pro or con for the tax cap so thank you very much um, anything further in your report okay uh, Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Councilor Mould. I was a little late getting up there. We had a uh, appointments committee meeting this afternoon, and in between meetings, I really wanted a cup of coffee, so I ran down to Dunkin' Donuts. And if you're going to be late, you don't show up empty-handed. So, for those of you lucky enough to be in the audience tonight, there are a couple of dozen donuts back there, for all you Cub Scouts. So I hope you'll uh, participate in that, help yourselves. And for those of you listening at home, if you get here quick enough, you might still get one. <laughs> So, you better move fast, those cups so look there's, hungry. <laughs> so there's coffee and donuts back there for everyone. Thank you very much for the comment and the donuts. Any um, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda? If they are, please, if there are any citizens who want to speak, please come forward to the podium. No? No? Yes? Yes, sir. Please state your name and your address, please. I'm Eric Peterson from Oakhurst Road. I was just curious, uh, what percentage of voters, did, registered voters, did vote in Cape? 80.45%. Uh, what was the state, the state average? We don't know that yet. That won't be determined until, until after the governor signs a proclamation. That's 20 days after the election. Cape Elizabeth had 6,404 voters. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It's truly amazing. Anyone else who would like to come forward and speak on anything not on the agenda? Okay. I see no further movement, so we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting held October 13th. Do I hear a motion? Councillor Backer. 
I move the approval of the Wednesday, October 13, 2004, Town Council Minutes. There's second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councilor Backer? Um, a couple of very small things. Um, one of them, uh, I think, the result of the miracle of word processing. At the top of page two of the minutes, we have a um, repeat, a duplicate of the reference to the minutes of meeting number 4-04-05. We can just strike the last. <clears throat> the language at the top of page two is being a duplicate. And on page four, under item number 64-04-05, referring to the Goddard Mansion report in the second motion, at the end of the first line, the word issued should be changed to issues. That further. it? That's it. Great. Thank you for those corrections. Um, with those corrections, I assume those who moved and seconded are okay with those corrections. Any other discussion? No? Oh, uh, I think the town clerk needs a new proofreader last <laughs> next uh, month. I failed. So. I, I, I think she needs not to have a huge election with 80% turnout in the interim, too. So, um, All those in favor? It's unanimous, 6-0. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Backer, for your careful reading. Now we're moving on to item number 65, um, 0405, which is a public hearing and then subsequently action with regard to an open space the, the zoning ordinance regarding open space provisions. Um, public hearing first, or should we have? Okay. I'll declare this public hearing is open. Anyone who would like to come forward and speak on this item, please do so. Please come forward to the podium. And Madam Chair, before we get started on this, um, I'd like to recuse myself from consideration in keeping with um, all of the past considerations of this item okay should we i think we need to vote on that don't we i would don't we move use... to recuse councillor backer from further discussion on this item Good. and moved and seconded all in favor unanimous thank you and i will step down during consideration thank you i'm sorry so uh sir please Forward. Good evening. My name is John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, um, and I represent uh, Steve, Pat, and Robert Bothell. And the Bothells, who actually, I think, initiated this text amendment, um, they're in the process of doing their estate planning and including uh, some master planning of their land on Ocean House Road. They own about 16 acres. And this text amendment will allow them to go forward, finalize their, their master planning without actually um, detailing or, or committing to the detail of that, uh, of that master plan. So uh, we do support this text amendment. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Anyone else who would like to speak, please come forward. Seeing no one else. I declare this public hearing closed. All right, counselors, uh, do I hear a motion? I will move adoption of open space zoning amendment um, to the zoning ordinance section 19-7-2 paren B, close paren, um, as it appears in our package. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I would like to, I forgot to mention, um, well, I guess I haven't had an opportunity yet, to, but I would like to mention that the Ordinance Committee um, voted 3-0 at their September 9th meeting to recommend that this amendment be adopted by the Town, town Council. Any further discussion? With the Ordinance? 
would the ordinance committee have actually voted then 2-0? I know because I because Councillor Backer was recusing himself. Oh, that's I true. came in. I'm um, great a member great. of all the committees as chair, and so I was voting that way. Okay. But thank you for checking it. Okay. Councillor Roberts. I'm obviously in, in favor of doing this. I think it'll make it easier for people that are trying to develop their land. I only have one concern, and I, I guess I'm asking perhaps that staff monitor it to make sure that with something like this, um, that the open space is being delayed to the second or third or fourth phase of the development, that it could, can't, there has to be, we need to make sure there's a performance guarantee or something, or at least watch to make sure it's not a problem, and that the open space part of that development may never take place. Um, I, I can see in this how that could be, could be part of it. Um, you'd make more phases, build more phases into it than you actually really plan on ever doing and leave the open space to the last section of it so the town never gets that. And I just want to make sure we're watching it to make sure that that's not happening. So, but I fully support the change itself. Okay, thank you. Are there further comments? Councilor Fritz? Maybe, maybe I, wasn't, I, I wasn't considering that um, aspect of it. I'm, I'm assuming that each phase would hold open, would take its share of the open space. Um, and maybe Maureen could explain. Could we have the town planner, Ms. Amira, please come forward? Thank you. Well, the concept of phasing is something that's done in all the different uh, zoning districts of the town as part of any kind of a subdivision, an open space versus a traditional subdivision. And whenever we have phasing, each phase has to, on its own, meet all the requirements of the ordinance. So not just open space, but the ability not to create a dead-end road or to provide emergency access or water supply or whatever. Every phase would have to show it can comply as part of that phase. So to, to meet Councilor Roberts' concern, if there was a large parcel of land that was designated the open space and the project was divided into three phases, at a minimum, one third of that parcel would have to be deeded over for each phase, so that by the third phase you would have all of it. In fact, uh, our experience has been that when you have a phase project and a large chunk of open space, they tend to give us the whole thing in the first phase. So we will keep track of that, but it, it is part of our, our existing requirements and it has been our practice as well. Thank you very much. Any further comments, discussion? No? Then every, all in favor? It's unanimous, 5-0. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Um, item number... 660405, which is a report from the Ordinance Committee. Um, since we are temporarily, or not at the moment, um, we are at the moment without a chair of the Ordinance Committee, so I can just summarize. The Ordinance Committee um, has recommended that a public hearing be set for Monday, December 13, 2004, on the proposed amendments to the traffic ordinance regarding um, the Denver boot, basically. It's been moved? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there, is there any discussion? Uh, this is just a recommendation to set a public hearing for December. I don't know if Mr. McGill, uh, town manager would like to explain what we're doing or I can try, I can make a stab at it if you would like. Sure. Uh, basically what we're doing in this ordinance is trying to enforce the uh, current um, parking ordinance where people are getting tickets for uh, parking in areas where they have been basically asked not to. And but the enforcement of the, trying to collect on that is, is very difficult under the current procedure. Uh, you have to go to court and everything else in order to get that done. And it doesn't, it's not worth the police officer's time, like my, my sense of it. But what's happening is the collection rate is going down, down, down to the point where it, Everybody's saying, well, if they're not paying, I'm not going to pay either. And obviously, the no parking areas are 
designated for public safety or to protect property, and I don't care just to be nasty villains in town. So what the police chief has come up with is this, uh, and through the ordinance committee, would be an ordinance that uh, would allow the town to impound or immobilize vehicles. And as part of that, um, take, and it's going to be retroactive as far as the tickets, but not back to uh, day one of Cape Elizabeth, but we will be holding it that anybody that has tickets that are issued after December 31 of 2002 and remain unpaid would be subject to the visions of this uh, Denver boot or impoundment of the vehicle if they have not moved it after they've gotten the boot. And there will be 24 hours for people to remove their car once the uh, boot has been placed onto it. And in order to get it back, there's a uh, $50 boot uh, disengagement fee plus all tickets uh, outstanding tickets must be paid and there is a process for a person getting a ticket to appeal to the uh, police department and I assume that most of this language is on the website people w wish to look it up so if people have concerns about it and want to speak to it next month that's a real brief synopsis of uh, where we're at on that one thank you very much Councillor Roberts um, Councillor Fritz I just had a question I couldn't um, tell from this copy of uh, the ordinance that was in our packet. Did the ordinance committee make any changes from what had been submitted to us by the police chief? Yes, there were some. I was not at all the Denver Boot ordinance, uh, the, all the ordinance committee meetings that uh, discussed the Denver Boot, but I don't know if Councilor Roberts or Councilor Backer would like to um, comment on the changes. I know there were there were some um, changes made to the language to clarify it, and then there was also some, there were also some changes about the levels of fees. And so, would either one of you like to address Councilor Fritz's question on what changes the ordinance committee made to the first draft of this? Of um, Denver Boot? Sure. The the concept as presented in the original draft is retained. Um, in what you have before you, but it's been substantially reworded just for clarity. Yeah, there was one substantive change as well, and the, the chief had originally recommended that by the fourth ticket, yeah. that it be when it go into effect, and the, the ordinance committee recommended that after two, in essence, by the third ticket, mm -hmm. that the boot could potentially uh, go on. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to recall, too, of the fee schedule. I didn't notice that in here, but we had done some work on that as well. The, the, the fee schedule itself is not is never in the ordinance. It's not, it is not part of the ordinance. Well, I guess we don't really need to discuss that at the point, then. I mean, it'd be helpful if there was some way to, you know, to let us know what is changed from the first time we read. I mean, I'm, With the police. Yeah, I've Maybe a cover or some, some sort of thing. To yeah, there was a version that w we circulated within the ordinance committee that showed the marked text of text added and deleted. Um, and you're right, it probably would have been helpful to circulate that to the entire council for you to be able to see readily mm -hmm. exactly what language was changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was such an overhaul in the overall format of it that virtually all of it was either stricken or oh. underlined with added text because the formatting was changed so much. There are really, if I could add to that, there are really only two changes at all from, from the ordinance not mentioning the boot at all. One is two definitions on the third page and then it's the seventh or eighth page contain it's just one page and then four lines that that contains the substance mm -hmm. of it so it's really only one page of stuff to look at mm -hmm. so and I think Councilor Backer is so right it was so extensively rewritten for style um, and clarity that uh, I'm not sure it's a pretty simple ordinance really mm -hmm. so I think with one page people could pretty much understand it and I have a question I just to refresh my memory there is, will there be a list available, assuming this were to pass, 
is there going to be a list available or a notification or something? Would people be able to know if they had two tickets? I see yes. the manager is shaking his head, yes. You know, pr provided they don't get two tickets in one day. Well, yes. Uh, but, you know, but it, as they get tickets, if they don't pay, there'll be, you know, there'll be notices sent to them. Right, just so they know they're on the, the danger list. So. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded to um, set a public hearing for December. Uh, and uh, hearing no further discussion, all but, of you know, If I may, I'd oh. just like to follow up on the town manager's last comment just to make sure that what he said is correct. And if I heard you correctly, uh, Mike, you were indicating that people would have notices sent to them that they have outstanding tickets? That's So hopefully they would pay within the, the allotted amount of time, but if they don't, then they'd get a notice and they'd get another notice. However, if they, you know, indiscriminately park everywhere in one day, <laughs> there's no requirement that we, we send them the notice. Because there, there's nothing in the regulations themselves that requires the town give somebody notice that they no, have tickets. That's correct. And there never is in one of these because then everyone would always say they never got it and that, that's the reason why there's no specific requirement, but okay. it is our intent to be sending reminder letters and dunning notices. Okay, thank you. Any further comments or questions? Councilor Moll. I just want to state for the record that I did prefer this ordinance when it was you get three tickets and then boot it on the fourth. And I don't like the fact that it's retroactive for two years. So. Okay. Any further comments? Okay, it's been moved and seconded, seconded to uh, set a public hearing for this for December. All those in favor? Uh, five. All those against? One. Councilor Mould. Thank you. Okay, our next item is. Um, Item number 640405, which appears to be out of order because it was tabled from our October meeting. So our first action is to remove it from the table. Do I hear a motion? Councilor Beck. I move that we remove item 64-04-05 from the table. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of removing it from the table? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Opposed? One. Okay. And that one was Councilor Lynch. Um, okay, now we will move on to consideration. This, has, this matter has to do with a policy relating to the general fund undesignated fund balance. Um, and I would ask the manager to give us an overview of this. We had a workshop, the council had a workshop on this but for the sake of the public, if we could just have a brief int introduction so people know what this is about. Yeah, a, a practice over the last 10 to 15 years in keeping with generally accepted accounting principles is for municipalities to develop a, a policy on fund balance. Uh, Cape Elizabeth has had an informal policy that's never been approved by the town council of seeking to have a, a uh, un undesignated fund balance 10% of the tax commitment. And that's always been something that's been discussed every year with the budget, and usually we, we fall somewhat short of it, but, it, but it's been the, the informal goal, never formally adopted. In the meantime, the bond rating agencies, the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, as well as other folks with interest in, in accounting principles, have been suggesting that instead of the benchmark of using tax commitment, you, would, you instead use a benchmark that relates to undesignated fund balance, particularly of general fund revenue. Uh, the, during, you know, the, the issues has come up, it came up a year ago, but it particularly came up this, this past year as we were borrowing the money for the school project. And we have a, a gentleman named Joe Pitara who's with Moores and Cap in Boston. He serves as our financial advisor on all the different bond issues. He interacts with all the borrowers, he interacts with, with Moody's, the bond rating agency, as well as the Standard & Poor's, another bond rating agency. And when they were looking at Cape Elizabeth this year, 
they started to get a little bit nervous in terms of maintaining our current bond rating, uh, bond rating in terms of did we have adequate reserves. And quoting from a letter that, that uh, Mr. Katara sent to us August 9, 2004, uh, both rating agencies, and referring to uh, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, noted that the undesignated fund balance was not consistent with, the, with that expected by a double A credit. Uh, that is, ex expectation that fund balance be maintained at or above current levels. Failure to do so could have negative credit implications, Moody's. Uh, quote, while not having a formal policy, the town uses a measure of maintaining an undesignated fund balance in an amount not lower than 10% of the tax, tax annual tax limit. Over the last five years, audited fiscal years, this measure is an average of 6.99 of annual total revenues, while no year's measure was less than 5.91. There's a chart here that shows we were, we've been as low as 6.4%. Uh, so Moody's, in order to maintain our current bond rating, Moody's is recommending and standard employees that we be 8% or better, if you look at all the different materials that, that was handed out. Uh, 8.33 is the standard that, that most, most places use. In addition, when the town council in that workshop met with our auditors, Runyon, Kirstein, and Willette, they pointed out, it was, it was emphatic, you know, deliberately discussed, what is it that you guys, you folks, you professionals, ought to be more formal, recommend uh, for a policy? And they came right out and said 0.833%, one month operating revenues. Uh, so, so now we have it recommended by our auditors, by the two rating agencies, and by our financial advisor, and it's also the one that the GFOA looks at. Uh, the reason you have a, the reason why this is important is one, obviously, if, if we don't follow with the rating agencies, they're going to, we're not going to have as good a, a, a rating, and as a result, we're going to pay more every time we borrow if we don't have, have the rating that we want. Secondly, it's, it's important for cash flow. We don't have to borrow money. We don't have lines of credit at banks. Uh, so as a result, even though we can borrow for far small amounts, we're able to pay our bills each and every week and meet the payroll without getting into a panic situation where suddenly we have to call a special meeting and say that we need to, an authorization to draw on a line of credit. If we began to do that, I think people would begin to wonder about the finances of this community. Uh, we, thirdly, uh, you know, we only get tax money, the, the great bulk of it, the property tax, twice a year. We have to live off our cash flow. Uh, so it's important to have those reserves to help us meet our cash flows. Without those reserves, you know, we're not in a position to, to be able to pay our bills to, to get by. Well, you know, we, we, have, we have some other reserves. We have reserves for sick leave accruals, for vacation accruals. Uh, also for our designated fund balances, those things that, for example, is money in the Green Belt account, is some money in the Road account, we have some of those reserves. It's the combination of those reserves that enables us to get by to pay our bills every month. 0.833% is one month's expenditures. I think if anyone looks at their own household budget, you know, most everyone likes to have one month of money of their expenses in an account so that if some emergency came up, if it was some natural disaster or whatever, they had this money to turn to. You know, most, I think, want more than one month. Uh, and, you know, with, what's being recommended here is one month. So I would, you know, strongly encourage the council to adopt this so that we can maintain our credit rating and that we can follow the advice of Moody's, of Standard and & Poor's, and of our audience. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. And just as a um, informational point, I think you, a couple of times you said 0.833%, and I think you meant to say 8.33%. One twelve. One twelve. Okay. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Councilor Roberts. I would move to set 8.33% as the uh, general fund on designated fund balance each year. Okay. Is there a second? Second that for Would you, we have um, language that we drafted as a result of our workshop for the policy. Would you like, uh, you might want to just amend 
this. I don't know. Okay, sure. I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I'm not trying to suggest yeah. that you have to. We'll no, go with your motion. Then. I have my notes all over this one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is this the language? So it's the policy as described, as in, described our, in our handouts. Then I would move to move that for the general fund, the town council shall seek to maintain a general fund on designated fund balance of 8.33 percent of annual general fund operating revenues which percentage is equivalent to revenues anticipated in an average one-month period. If the targeted on designated fund balance is exceeded, 50% of any excess funds shall be used to reduce the tax commitment in the next budget to be considered by the town council. The remaining 50% shall be placed in capital reserve to fund reserve fund to replace equipment and or to undertake needed infrastructure improvements. During any year when the undesignated fund balance is less than its target level, the town council shall attempt to increase, as a percentage of operating revenues, the undesignated fund balance. As long as the undesignated fund balance is below the target level, the undesignated fund balance shall not be used to support the annual budget or other capital needs. If doing so will result in the undesignated fund balance being, low, being a lower percentage of operating revenues than the previous fiscal year. My first one was much easier to say. <laughs> You're right. Um, we, you can, if you so desire, you could add on the Portland headlight the fund policy time. as just as worded. If you Very well. Uh, no, no, I mean you don't have to read it. You can just. Oh, thank you very much. The manager has corrected me um, that 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 fund policy should be done by the museum board, and I I stand corrected. I'm sorry. Got ahead of myself. Then I believe so, I'm finished. <laughs> then, then you're finished, yes. And was there a second? I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Councilor Fritz, thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Councilor Lynch. Um, first, I, I want to apologize to all of the council and the manager. I missed the workshop. Um, my absence was unavoidable, as all of you know, with an ill family member. But uh, this is. Uh, a topic that I think is very important to the taxpayers and so um, despite missing the workshop I um, feel it necessary to probably discuss this at more length and you, the rest of you care to having sat through the workshop so I hope you accept my apologies and being a Johnny come mm -hmm. lately to the issue but um, first of all what we're really talking about um, we use a lot of high polluting words, the general fund, non-designated fund balance. And what we're really talking about, just so the public understands, is we're talking about our surplus. Right now, um, the town is a surplus of approximately $2.6 million, and that's 10% of revenues. Now, 1.5 million of that um, 2.6 million, um, which is approximately 6.5 Four percent of our revenues is what we call the undesignated uh, fund balance, and it's what we're talking about tonight. Um, you know, so what does all of this mean? It means we're increasing our surplus. What will it take for us to get there? I think it's important for the public to know how much more money we are proposing to put aside in surplus. And it's fairly easy to do once you do the math. If we're at 6.4% and we want to move to 8.33%, we're moving basically two percentage points. We need to increase the undesignated surplus over $600,000 for the next budget year. Um, and I want to go back again on the surplus issue the designated and the undesignated so we all understand what we're doing um, as i mentioned the surplus is 2.6 million dollars of that 1.1 is what we call designated and in our annual report um, we have a list of um, what that means and basically it's things that we decided that we would do but haven't gotten to for instance, um, Goddard Mansion work, um, planning, um, GIS account, Greenbelt, Greenbelt work. So while we call it a designated fund balance, it's not legally 
required. It isn't a legal reserve that we've set aside. Um, so it is a surplus, and, and yes, we intend to get to it, and that's why we separate out the designated from the undesignated. But I think it's important for the public to understand that our current surplus is at 10% of our reven revenues and includes 1.1 million of designated things that we do intend to do. Now, the other 1.5 million is undesignated, and I think that's what we generally look at as surplus. And so the question before us really is, how much do we need to raise from the taxpayers for surplus? How much surplus is enough? The proposal that the managers put before us would have us, as I mentioned, raise the surplus by over $600,000. And I realize he's proposing that we do it over time, but it's over 600000 for next year's budget. It would be more in the succeeding years as our budget goes up. Um, and frankly, we would be raising it on a percentage basis to a level reached only once in the last nine years. Now, I think we need to ask ourselves, what's the purpose of the surplus? As the manager has said, it's, it's to keep Wall Street happy. We want to keep our bond rating high. And I certainly agree with the manager on that. Um, I think it's, the manager had read from um, some things, and I, I also have some things to share with us. I know um, Moores um, and Cabot wrote to us in August and said uh, that the town is in a select company in that less than 6% of municip municipalities are in the double A range. At the same time, Moody's um, wrote and said that they characterize our reserves as now adequate reserves. Now adequate reserves. Um, and Wall Street didn't hesitate to lend the town money um, in August, just three months before the pending collective um, issue. So um, I think it, I think we need not only to look at what the bankers say they they want to see, but what in fact they have accepted and will accept. And in the last nine years, only one year, have we had a surplus that approaches the range that the manager is seeking. Our bond rating is high. It's a double A two from Moody's, and and uh, it's a double A from Standard and Poor's. Now Standard and Poor's put out a benchmark piece a couple of years ago. And um, I can't remember whether this was something that uh, Michael gave us this year or something I may have had in my files from previous years. But if I can um, just read from it, and it, it's just benchmarking um, for purposes of what, what um, Wall Street looks at. And uh, I looked at total general fund balance. Um, and Standard and Poor's has characterized a balance in the 5 to 15 percent range as adequate. This is the total general fund balance, and we are now at 10 percent. So we're right in the mid-range. We're at 10 percent, and they say between 5 and 15 is adequate. And of course, our undesignated fund balance is at 6.4 percent. Now, they also have another category of on-reserve general fund balance, which I understand it means the same thing as our on-designated fund balance. Um, again, they give us a range, and they say that an adequate on-reserve general fund balance is in the 2 to 8 percent range. And we are currently at 6.4 percent. The manager would like us to go to 8.33 percent for the undesignated fund balance, and that is above um, what uh, Standard & Poor's has designated or termed adequate. Um, we have got some other information here I want to share with you, if you'll bear with me. Moores and Cabot also had put out a piece, and again, I apologize if you all haven't seen this or it's something that was from some earlier files that I had, but it's a little piece they called In Consideration of a Fund Balance Policy. 
And um, Moores and Cabbage states generally a fund balance of 5% of budget is deemed prudent. A fund balance of 5%. We're at 10% as a fund balance and 6.4% for an undesignated fund balance. They go on to say a smaller balance may be justified by a long-term trend of annual budget surplus, while a larger balance may be warranted, particularly if budget revenues and expenses are economically sensitive or otherwise not easily forecasted. I think given the um, financial strength of our town, um, our budget revenues and expenses are not that economically sensitive and they have been fairly well forecasted by our manager over the years, so that would suggest um, that a larger balance may not be warranted. Now, does Wall Street want to see more? Oh, wait, let me read one more. No, I'll, I'll read one more thing, I think. Um, I'm getting repetitive, but Moody's in 2002 had put out a piece also on the size of your general fund balance. And Moody's, um, as the others did, said that um, the fund balance should be between 5 and 10 percent. Determining which end of the spectrum is best suited to a municipality's needs must be governed by the sensitivity of revenue streams and the potential for natural disasters or other unforeseen budget fluctuations. Now, uh, Michael, you know, Michael read from something that says they'd like to see more money, and of course they do. Bankers always want to see more assets on the financial statement. But the bottom line is that due to our already strong financial commission, we are in the top 6% of all municipalities for credit worthiness. Now, if we were going to increase our surplus for reasons of credit worthiness, then I think it's incumbent upon the manager to show just how much more money we will save in the cost of credit if we move, say, from the top 6% of municipal credit worthiness to the top 1%. Now, when I met with the manager, I asked him what the reasons would be for increasing the surplus, and, and as he uh, mentioned tonight, there are two. There's the satisfying Wall Street reason, and then the other one is um, that the surplus is a means of short-term borrowing for the town. And I don't think the manager has come to us and said that we need a larger surplus because he is in a cash crunch where the town is in a cash crunch um, situation. Um, I'd also point out that in terms of short-term borrowing, um, I understand that the town's cost of credit is about 3%. Many of our taxpayers are paying significantly more for their short-term borrowing, particularly if their short-term borrowing is credit card borrowing. So um, I, I just have great difficulty. Um, seeing that either reason justifies increasing the surplus to the level that the uh, manager is uh, pushing us to, to towards. Um, you know, saving money and having surpluses, as the manager has said, is generally considered a good thing. It's always a good thing in our own personal household finances. But I have to remind us, we're saving other people's money tonight. Um, the taxpayer's money, and I think, again, we really need to ask ourselves how much is enough. For me, the, the answer is the current level is enough. It's enough for Wall Street, and it's enough to meet our short-term borrowing needs. Um, I can think of a lot of better uses for the $600,000 than putting it to surplus. And first and foremost, I'd like to see it kept in our taxpayer's pockets. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lynch. Are there other comments? Uh, Mr. McGowan? Yeah, I, Councilor Lynch knew I'd respond. Uh, Michael, can I just make oh, one yeah. comment? Um, Councilor Robert. Lynch made one statement that uh, the manager was pushing us. I don't think Mike needs to come to that defense of himself on that one. Michael hasn't been pushing us. He laid out a scenario, the council debated it in workshops, and agreed that this was a good figure at that point. You bring up some very good points. I think that was probably a, a wrong term to use. Um, okay, well, I, I certainly will take that, and I certainly don't mean to, to uh, 
suggest that, and the manager is, was gracious in his time spent with me on this issue. And uh, if I said push, it's only because I know that he's quite excited about this topic, and that's why he's responding to what I raised before. But I certainly did not mean to suggest that he's pushing us. Yeah. And he knows he can't <laughs> push us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we can disagree disagreeably, though. Yes. Right. Agreeably. 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 Okay. Agreeably. You not, know what I not mean. disagreeably. <laughs> Just a, a couple of different points. Uh, and I'll try to make this relatively brief. Uh, Councillor Lynch has quoted from a couple of documents. Let me fully read the documents. One is Moody's, the February 2002 report that she, she mentioned. And she said that there should be a level of between 5 and 10 percent should be targeted. What the report actually says, a minimum level of between 5 and 10 percent. When the word minimum is there as a qualifier, that's a lot different meaning than simply a level of between 5 and 10 percent. When she spoke, I didn't hear the reference to a minimum level of 5 percent. Again, that's the Moody's, the bond credit rating agency. In the Standard & Poor's report, the uh, February 8, 1999 one she referenced, benchmark general obligation ratios, uh, she, she mentioned general fund balances she mentioned that adequate was was uh, for total general fund balance five to fifteen percent. Strong is greater than fifteen percent, which we're, we're quite a bit lower. Uh, unreserved fund balance again strong is eight percent. She and I have a disagreement on whether or not we ought to be strong or, or we adequate. ought to be adequate. That's right. Uh, I choose to be strong. Uh, I choose to be strong because it's what the auditors recommend. It's what the rating agencies recommend. It gives us cash flow. Uh, and a vote to adopt something less than 8% is implicitly a vote to lower the town's bond rate. Implicitly, because when you look at the reports that we got this year from Moody and from <laughs> S&P, they specifically indicate uh, that, uh, for example, the rationale from Standard & Poor's a slightly offsetting factor pertains to the town's lean reserve level. Lean. The undesignated general fund balance fell below 6% in fiscal 2003. Double underlined, which is in the low end of a double-A category credit. What they're telling us, they're giving us a warning, and they were very clear when we spoke to them and when they spoke to Joe Katara, that we came very close to losing our bond rating. And, you know, when, when they underline something twice, I think there's, there's a message that, you know, we're, we're, we're about to get our, our bond rating lowered. So that, that was S&P. Moody. Uh, Moody expects the town will grow the now adequate reserve to a level more in line with the historical norm, approximately 15% of revenue, given management's commitment to maintain healthy reserves and a track record of timely tax Marianne asked me, where did they get that? Where did they get that expectation? Expectation, yeah. and I, you know, you, you, you do the dance with them, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I indicated that I hoped that, oh. you know, would return it. Cause it it's a point, they, they specifically asked that point of, you know, your bond rate, your, 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 your revenues are falling apart. Uh, not falling apart, your revenues are, <laughs> yeah. your undesignated fund Don't balance is going that. down. You know, in, in this bit, you know, you know, Marianne is, is a lawyer by training, and I'm not, but, you know, sometimes I try to rise to the, rise to the occasion. Uh, you know, she mentions this $600,000. Uh, you know, you read what Jack uh, was in his motion, and it didn't say we were going to reach that overnight, and that's the target. And the reason that delta is as big as it is is because we're much lower than where we wanted, where we would, where I would have wanted us to be anyway. We have consistently gone into surplus, we've had problems with estimating revenues, and you look at all the different communities that we benchmark ourselves against, the Falmouths, the Scarboroughs, the South Portland, the Cumberland, the, the Yarmouth, I believe now, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but when we benchmarked those things a couple of years ago, we were the, the lowest of all those communities. I don't, I don't think we should make those statements unless we have the numbers in front of us. Now, I, uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I, we were the lowest, and I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that unless I was pretty comfortable. So I, you know, I, I just think if the council wishes to do something below 8%, that is a message to our bondholders, to our bond rating agencies, that you're willing to have a lower credit rating. 
and you're willing to be adequate instead of strong. Uh, can I okay. respond? Okay, but I then as chair, I'm going to exercise my prerogative to let other people have comments. Uh, okay, so. I understand. I, I just don't, and I respect I, both your comments, but I don't want this to I understand. turn into a two-way debate. I just want to say I, I think it's equally dangerous to have a fund policy of 8.33% and perhaps not ever get there. I would rather us not have a fund policy and continue to, as we have in the past, um, you know, work hard to maintain an adequate policy that maintains our um, reserves at a level that's satisfactory to Wall Street. So I don't think it's necessary to have a fund policy, and I think it's uh, perhaps more dangerous to have one that we find we can't live with. So, okay. so I could support this if it was a fund policy that said from five or an undesignated fund balance of between five and 8.33%, which gives us some wiggle room, if you will. But um, otherwise, I think we're getting into dangerous territory by not being in a position to support this level of surplus. Okay. I think just to make sure this isn't just point counterpoint, I, uh, yeah, other counselors have have uh, questions or comments, and I thought I saw Council Fritz first. I mean, I'm I'm wondering um, if we are at an adequate level at the present time, and we got to a strong level. What would be the difference in say what we I borrow for the school, which is what we. Doing that. I mean, what, how, what are we talking about in terms of a better interest rate and what, what that means? It, it depends on what the market is at the time, but it can be, you know, 30 basis points in that range. It's, it's three tenths of one percent. Three tenths of one percent. Um, but it, but it varies. It varies. But it varies from, you know, Day to day, you know, it does not mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. Okay, Councillor Mole. I just wanted to comment that at, at this time, I'd rather leave the current practice as it is than put any additional burden on our taxpayers to come up with some additional funds over the next couple of years. It kind of goes against what we had committed to earlier in the year when we said that. Uh, as a council, we would try to keep our budget over the next three years to the consumer price index or less. I'd rather, you know, I feel comfortable where we are. We have an excellent bond rating. Um, if we saw that bond rating slip in the future, then I'd take corrective action at that point. But at the moment, I'm inclined to leave our current practice where it is uh, rather than put any additional burden on our taxpayers or force us through that process of trying to raise funds there by cutting it out of other parts of the budget, giving up other items. So, so I, you know, having a full month's reserve on hand, um, I'm just, you know, not going to support tonight. If, if I could just clarify something, you talked about our the spending, the resolution of the spending cap, the consumer price index, that was an expenditure cap, and I believe that this does that have an impact on it? This has no impact no on impact the... No impact on the operating expenditures, so... Well, it may not have an impact on the operating expenditures, but raising that $600,000 has to come out of somewhere, and I'm not at this time ready to pass that on to the taxpayers. Okay. Um, Council Backer, did you have a comment? Um, I do. Um, first, with regard to the town manager's lack of legal training, <clears throat> it garners no sympathy from this end. <laughs> he seems to be holding his own quite well, in spite of the lack of formal training. Um, second, and more important, in our packet for this evening, we have a document published by Moody's Investors Services, 
um, from September of 2004 titled Moody's Public Finance Group 2004 Regional Ratings National Medium. Trying to make sense of exactly what the significance of this is. But on page five, it has the municipal finance ratio analysis for U.S. cities with a population of less than 50,000. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> and way less than 50,000. <laughs> well, they don't have a category for way less than 50,000. <laughs> they just have less than 50,000. No, I meant we are way less. Right. I, I, I realize that. Under the double A um, category of bond ratings, the unreserved, undesignated general fund balance as a percentage of revenues um, is 15, shown as 15 yeah. percent, which seems to argue in favor of increasing where we are now at apparently 10 percent um, to bring ourselves in line with the median of other towns in our category of under 50,000. 50, of interest though, when I look at this, if you look at triple A ratings for towns of under 50,000, they have an unreserved undesignated general fund balance of 11.25%. So they have a higher rating with a lower undesignated general fund balance. And if you go the other direction, look at, for example, B double A, a lower credit rating, but with a median unreserved undesignated fund balance as a percentage of revenues of 22%. So the higher, in, according to this, if I'm reading it right, the higher the unreserved undesignated general fund balance, the lower the credit rating as a median. I don't quite get what this is telegraphing to us. And then when you go down one more rating step, it goes to 2.45%. Right, which I would expect. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand why a B double A has a higher undesignated fund balance um, than the double A, and why a triple A rating has a smaller undesignated general fund balance. And can I just add, because I looked at these numbers too this afternoon, David, and if you go to the next page and you look at U.S. school districts, and you go to the double A population less than 50,000, you see undesignated general fund balance of 4%. So it's all over the lot, which gets me back to feeling that what the lenders are looking for are a whole host of economic fundamentals, not the least of which is, do we have a population that pays its property taxes on time? Are we a good credit rating? And do we have some surplus? Um, so, but the other, numbers are all over the lot. Other comments? Council Roberts. Thank you. <coughs> Given that the manager is reading that uh, we are being told we need to get there, it seems to me that it's not really fiscally prudent not to try and make sure we protect that. If you lose that credit rating from the triple from the double A and go down. It's extremely difficult to get it back up, uh, and that would be a, that's a big concern of mine. The concerns about having the surplus on hand, you're not retaxing people. If you've got the money there, you're earning interest on it. It's, you're not retaxing anybody. I, I, I have a hard time understanding that, but it seems to me like a, I think perhaps a lot of people didn't have all this stuff. We we're having stuff read to us, but we don't have it in front of us. And maybe it's something we should hold off on voting on to it and voting and take a, another look at it in a workshop session. But, um, clearly, this is not the right place to debate when all of us don't have the information in front of us. Okay. I didn't quite get to finish my, oh, my comment. Sorry. No, that, that's okay. Um, I, anyway, uh, making that observation, again, I'm not quite sure what these numbers mean. However, um, I am in favor of voting to approve um, setting the undesignated surplus at 8.33 percent. Um, the policy as proposed does not require that we move to 8.33 percent this year or next year. It simply requires that we make an effort to try and move toward it and that we not, and when we haven't yet met it, that we not 
spend that we not reduce our surplus to pay current annual operating expenses. So uh, by approving it, we're not required this year, we're not required next year um, to make any big leaps toward the 8.33%. If we make just the smallest of steps toward that, um, we're going to be headed in the right direction and we're sending the right message, I think, to our bond credit rating agency. Thank you. Councilor Fritz. Well, without repeating, I'd just like to um, agree with David on, on that. I mean, I'm concerned about the bond rating and that we gradually move toward it. Um, so I'm in favor of the first paragraph of this. I'm, I'm concerned about the second paragraph um, that if the undesignated fund balance is exceeded, that 50% would be used to reduce the tax commitment and the other 50% go to capital reserve. I would rather have 100% go to reduce um, the tax commitment. Um, so I don't know whether we specifically have to, uh, I would like to specifically say any um, when, when the fund balance is exceeded, it, it be put toward reducing the tax commitment in the coming year. Okay. Any further comments? Could I briefly? Uh, uh, Carol, the, I, I understand your viewpoint. The reason why it's 50 50 here in the proposal is that if you do 100%, you deal with what happened in South Portland a few years ago. If you have a good year, you use all of this additional surplus in one year to reduce the budget. You dig yourself a really big hole for the next year. By putting in reserve funds, what you begin to do is to look at some of the issues, like we're not taking care of our roads, we're not taking care of our infrastructure, and this levels it out. And, and ultimately, that does reduce taxes because you're not having to appropriate as much in the capital improvement account and as well you're you're taking care of your roads when you you know it's easy to fix a road you know through pavement management principles before it falls apart so the the attempt in doing that is to make sure you don't get these huge up and down spikes and to make sure that you're taking care of your infrastructure uh, through these capital reserves that in the longer run should be less of a burden on the tax base and potentially as well eliminate the need for, for borrowing from it sort of just smooths out the peaks and valleys it smooths out the peaks and valleys by having the 50 50 split. I, I'd just like to follow up on that in, in terms of it seems to me that the capital reserve fund or the needs of the roads and, and buying trucks or whatever it is should be really taken care of at budget time rather than to say, well, it wasn't important at budget time, but we'll do it anyway, you know, because we have a little extra money. I, I totally agree with you. And, and this would enable you at budget time to look into those reserve funds and instead, you know, not have to raise money in the budget because you can draw on the reserve. That's, that you're exactly right. It needs to be looked at during the budget process. Mm -hmm. So if you decide you want to buy a cruiser or a whatever, a plow whatever or something, it you can reduce the budget. Set aside already. But I think it's, it's easy to say if you have some surplus that, well, let's spend it, you know, on it. Okay. Okay. Scott's the rule. That wasn't directed at you. It's like, I feel like I'm never going to get to my comment. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say that I wholeheartedly agree with what the town manager said about the need for taking care of our roads. But more importantly, I 100% agree with Councillor Fritz's assertion that it needs to be done at budget time. And if there is a surplus, we're going to spend it. And to avoid that spending of surpluses that really should go back to the taxpayers, I am proposing that we amend this motion to change that to 100% of any excess funds shall be used to reduce the tax commitment in the next budget to be considered by the town council and strike the portion that the remaining 50% is to be put in the capital reserve fund, etc. cetera. Okay, it's been moved it. Did, did we have the, uh, uh, it's been so long. We had an original motion that was second, right? So there, it's been moved and seconded to amend the motion. 
discussion on amending, pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Anne. Um, discussion on amending the motion. Councilor Roberts. I'll only make one comment. And I've lived through those you know, when I've used the surplus. Um, I've given it back to read uh, to the uh, and reduce the budget according to the, or reduce that so the taxes would go down and then found out what had happened how to get back out of it. Um, it's a terrible idea. I can't afford it. I've been there. Councillor. Oh, I, I support um, Councillor Fritz's suggestion and Councillor Moult's um, amendment. I, I do think there will be a tendency if there is a larger surplus account that that cruiser or um, pothole will look a lot easier to be fixed and we won't have to make a difficult decision. So um, I don't like increasing the surplus more. I defended the surplus um, in a debate. I defended the current level of the surplus. I support having a healthy credit rating, but I don't think we should increase it. And if we do increase it, then I do support that anything in excess of the increased surplus to go back 100% to the taxpayers. Otherwise, it will get spent. That's human nature. Okay. I do not support the amendment um, because I am persuaded by Councillor Roberts' argument about it's sort of the whipsaw effect of up and down. And I think that there are enough of us on the council with the power to resist the temptation of um, you know, saying, oh, well, it'd be oh, so easy to spend. It's never easy. It's never an easy decision to say, oh, well, okay, we've got this surplus. Let's just go hog wild and spend it all. I don't think any of us take those decisions this lightly. So I do not support the amendment. Council Baxter, do you want to weigh in? Um, you don't, you don't well, have to. Or we can no, I don't mind. On the one hand, I mean, I'm thinking that it may be somewhat of an academic discussion, um, wondering whether what the uh, likelihood is of us ever exceeding the 8.33%. Um, I mean, as we see ourselves approaching 8.33%, we're not going to be making any effort. I, I can't see why the council would be adding to the undesignated surplus to take it above 8.33%. Um, so to that extent, I'm not quite sure it really matters um, whether we agree to give it back to taxpayers or leave it to 50-50 as it is right now, because I'm frankly finding it difficult to imagine us ever having to face that, um, assuming that we do in fact face it because it gets above 8.33%. Um, I guess I'm not really following the uh, the line of thinking from Councillor Roberts um, and from the chair. I, I think I'm just missing something, just recognizing that money is fungible and whether it comes out of the undesignated surplus or whether it comes from the budget process itself, whether a cruiser is purchased and whether money goes back to the taxpayers first and then in the budget process money is allocated. I, I'm not quite sure I see the distinction. Um, so I'm I'm not seeing a problem with agreeing to support the amendment. Uh, maybe somebody could explain that uh, that whip sawing effect to me. Oh, okay, but I saw Councilor Mole first. I just so. wanted to say that's my very point. As David Backer said, Councilor Backer just said. It's very unlikely that we would exceed the fund balance anyway. And if we did for that small amount, it gets ironed out in the budget process by first clearing the record by saying, okay, 100% of that is now back in the taxpayer's hand. But then through the budget process that we go through each spring, we determine what we're going to spend on. I don't see any, we're not self -forced. You know, our, our funds are fairly Fairly level. We don't. I don't expect that we're going to see big swings 
over this very small issue. But in order to make the uh, budget process even clearer, you know, if we have an excess, it really belongs to the taxpayers, and it should go back into their column at the beginning of the budget process, and then we decide whether we're going to spend it again or not. We don't need to suddenly say, oh, we're automatically going to spend 50% of it. Okay, thank you. I um, have been persuaded by Councillor Backer's argument um, that I don't think we're really going to be maxing out, going over 8.33% anyway, so I think it will be a moot point. So, Councillor Roberts, did you want to address that, or it sounds like now we've got yeah, I'd more votes make it at least one for the... The budget, I think that is absolute expenditure you have to go and you can't go below it. I know when it happens, it's usually when there's high inflation, you know, that, and the costs are, going, are escalating rapidly to, to do your, to run your tail. And then you have the temptation is to go and say, okay, we've got this surplus, it's overhead amount, and again, it's probably one of the gold breaks. You say, we can hold a increase in taxes if you have a 3%. Even though, they, even though you know they should be at six percent, or should, or should go with a zero tax increase one year. The following year, those costs have not gone away, and you don't have that money to back in to cover it to, to keep it from going up. So instead, you're getting potentially that the six percent that you covered in one year, and the six percent the next year. Again, it's in the inflationary times, it's the problem. All of a sudden, instead of getting six and six percent increases, you give them zero one year, and the next year you get a 12%. And the numbers that were used, and no account doesn't matter, but it, they were able to do creative finance that way for three, for, for two years. And the third year, the town was with a 20% increase. And that's when they had major problems. They used a buyout from IWS, uh, they used surplus one year, two years in a row, in high inflation, no increases. But guess what? Third year, we had a tax that revolted him because instead of just going up a little at a time, along with the rate of inflation, they got hammered. And nobody remembered that for two years in a row there was no tax increase. All they remember is what third year they got a 20%, they got nearly 20%. And that's when Plato happened. And again, as far as the point being moved, yeah, you're probably right. I don't see the word council we have, or any council we've had in the last number of years. They're going to be trying to boost up this uh, surplus that's just crazy, but then they go out and, and spend it on something. But that's just not going to happen. If we can get it to the 8% with the bond rating people want it, I don't see much effort trying to, to raise it beyond that. But I think you're making a mistake if, you're, if you don't uh, put something in it that tax in that unlikely event that money is there. I'll give it a try. The manager would like to make a comment, and then I'd like to move the question on the amendment language. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I think, as, as Councillor Moles explained it, you know, the, the the principle here and the understanding is is not to have any specific reserve. And Cape Elizabeth never really had reserves. And you know, every year the council puts all the issues on the table. They discuss them and debate them. And I think, you know, with with uh, Carol's amendment, you know, with that understanding that. You know that this, that this is fair. I also know that the council understands that when we look at our capital portion of the budget, that we're spending less than we were a dozen years ago. That we're spending a million dollars less than the projections show every year that we need to spend. So I know, as this council has always been fair and always been reasonable and tries to balance everything out, that the council, you know, there's no reason that I wouldn't think that once we got to the 8.33 percent, that the the councils at that time, whoever's sitting here, will be equally respectful and, and responsive and balancing how much you want to give back to the taxpayers the, the, compared to, uh, you know, how much uh, needs to be spent on capital. And I go back again to the, the Pilecki vote of, of a week ago. Uh, you know, I, I think while people are upset about taxes, you know, I, I think that did show some respect for the decision making of the council here over the years and, uh, that you do balance things out and you don't ask for more than you do need. And I, I think you know, if this is amended and if it's approved as amended, you know, in continuing that tradition of, of, of not, of trying to keep everything in balance. Thank you. Now I'm going to exercise the Chair's prerogative to move the question on the amendment. And the amendment, as I think I recall, is in the second paragraph. It would change it to say, if the targeted and undesignated fund balance is exceeded 100 percent, 
I'm just clarifying, you should correct me if I'm wrong, Council Chris, 100% of any excess funds shall be used to reduce the tax commitment in the next budget to be considered by the town council. And then the next sentence about the remaining 50% would be struck. That, that is the, that, that is that the intent, yeah. yes, and that is, <laughs> I'm just making sure we're on the same page here, that is the intent of both Council Fritz and Councilor Mould. So I'd like to move that question. All those in favor of that amendment to the motion, please raise your hand. Five. Opposed? One. Okay. So the question we are now discussing, hopefully soon to be finished discussing, is mm -hmm the amended version um are there i hesitate to ask are there any further brief comments okay good then i i need to make my comment which will be brief um i think i am in favor of the this amended version um as, a, as amended by council fritz and council moles i am in favor of this uh, policy um i think there's a difference between adequate and strong. Um, I think um, we need to move to the one month level, uh, which is the 8.33% uh, level. I think that forecasting revenues is increasingly difficult in the, given the current economy and the current tax environment. It's, even though the Pulaski Initiative uh, failed, there is a lot going on. Hopefully the legislature will buckle down and work on some serious tax reform, but I think um, forecasting revenues is difficult. Um, and so for those reasons and all the other reasons that a number of counselors have stated, I am in support of it. So I would like to move the question, sort of the amended version of the, um, of the fund balance policy. Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. All those in favor? Four. Opposed? Two. It passes four to two. Thank you very much. I know that was long, but um, it was definitely in the public interest. And um, I thank all the counselors for their well-reasoned um, and relatively cogent um, comments. Um, it's a difficult subject and I appreciate the different points of view. I know everyone is seriously, on the council is seriously trying to look out for the best interests of the public and where there may be some disagreements about exactly what the policy should be. I think that uh, our intent is always the same, to do what is right for the public and the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So moving on, we are on item number 67. <coughs> Excuse me, 0405, which has to do with the BB zone front setback. Um, the planning board is recommended by, oh, the planning board has referred to the ordinance committee a proposal about this BB district to reduce the front setback from 100 feet to 50 feet. So do I hear a motion to refer this to the ordinance committee? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. And moved and seconded. Discussion? I just wanted to thank Maureen O'Meara for sitting through the previous <laughs> <laughs> waiting for the discussion on this. Thank you, Maureen, for your patience. Is there any discussion? This is just to refer this to ordinance, so. Would Maybe it be appropriate to ask the uh, town planner to uh, just give us a brief overview of what the planning board did so that she hasn't wasted an entire evening sitting here? <laughs> Feel, feel free, <laughs> Ms. O'Meara, um, for a brief overview. Thank you. This is the zoning map of the town. Not a quick start. This is the BB district over here. So it's basically the end by the sea and the big empty field next door. Um, right now there's a setback requirement of 100 feet. 100 feet is the kind of setback you would use in a big office park. It's just not very appropriate. And the planning board took very little time and going into some of the workshops for a regular meeting, I think it was in 20 days they brought it back to you. Their feeling was, well, yes, it does benefit the by the city of current uh, business in the town, but it, it's just not a very good setback to have for 
A gets its own end, B, B gets its own end. It pushes businesses away from the street, and then inevitably they end up putting all their parking in the front yard anyway. So it's, it's just not a very hospitable setback for a business. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Councilor Lynch? I, I made the motion, but I guess um, I'm reminded by um, Councilor Mould that uh, we, some of us were ready to approve this a month ago, uh, but we were told we had to send it to the planning um, oh. commission. So I guess the question is, do we have to send it to the ordinance committee, um, or can we just approve it? It seems we would we have, have to set it, for public, to set it for public can hearing. Can we just set but it we, for a public hearing then? If, if we want to skip the ordinance committee, I'm sure the ordinance committee would appreciate it. Or, I, or if need. the ordinance committee felt that they had to review it, perhaps it could be set for public hearing and the ordinance committee could review it in the same month so that we could actually well, we have time in the regulatory process. We have the members of the ordinance committee All here, two, two, well, two mm -hmm. of them, plus me, that's great. Okay. Um, do, uh, pardon me? Yes, but I'm the third member. Oh. So. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Jack or David, do you feel a need to have it come through the ordinance committee? No, I don't. Do you, is there any need? Are we comfortable with what was the, I don't, there's not much in front of us here. Um, the, uh, the proposed text change is pretty small. Yeah. And my understanding was the whole idea was just because they are doing some Direct renovations and want to change the front of the hotel. Question is, no, I don't feel any need to me either. Okay. I'm willing to and I'd, I'd say the consensus of the ordinance committee is that we don't need it to go to the ordinance committee. So and I will withdraw my motion. Okay, would you like to make a different motion? Yes, I will make a motion to set for public hearing the recommendation of the planning board to reduce the front setback in the BB district from 100 feet to 50 feet. Second. And would that be a public hearing at our, our December council meeting? Yes. Okay. Second December. Been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Nope. All in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lynch. I think I, that's I just say a I, good idea. I hear frequently from, um, I shouldn't say frequently, but I hear from time to time that this town is anti-business and anti-this and anti-that, and I um, think it's, it's incumbent upon us when, when we can't act with some swiftness that we do so. Excellent idea. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Our next item is item number 680405. The Fort Williams Charitable Foundation is requesting approval of some amendments to their bylaws. Is there anything that the ma manager doesn't really feel a need to do an introduction? Um, I think the amendments are pretty straightforward. Um, they have to do with limiting the number of honorary directors. And um, there was a, a previous change that they made that they forgot to run by us, I guess, that allowed for the staggering of director's terms. Is there a motion? I'll move the proposed amendment to the Fort Williams Foundation. Second. And moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Okay. Would it be appropriate perhaps to read it so people that are listening would know which, what they are proposing? I don't, I don't even mind doing it if you a basic, a basic overview. I think it'd be nice to people know what we're voting on. I don't think it's going to be very clear. Knock yourself out. <laughs> uh -oh. um, basically what they're asking is that they had a limited number of ex officio or honorary members and they want to reduce it to a, a manageable, manageable number of, I think it was 25, if memory serves me correctly. I read this earlier. And um, yeah. if I'm not explaining it very well, if I actually got my mouth shut, I wouldn't get involved in it. <laughs> We're voting on something I can't even explain. Um, it was on a limited number before, and they resisted to 25. Okay, that's probably the easiest 
way to put it, of the honorary members. And I think we're kind of agreeing with them that that probably makes sense. So that's as good of an explanation as I can give you. Okay. Thank you. Council Lynch? Yes. And we're Thomas? also voting to stagger the term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any further comments? Hearing none. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, the next item is item number 690405, having to do with the Ordinance Committee Chairman and the Special Election. Um, due to Councilor McGinty's resignation from the Council, the Chairman position on the Ordinance Committee needs to be filled. Um, I'd like to just break these issues apart. But, so do I hear a motion on that? Councilor Backer. I move that Council Roberts, who is trying to duck this assignment, be appointed as chair of the Ordinance Committee. Second. Council Roberts, you may sit and be recognized. Second. Sit up and be recognized. Second. Sit high, Jenny. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Except I'm not going to hear from Councilor Roberts saying he doesn't want to do it. He'll do a fine job. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Chairman Roberts, your take away, you can be running those ordinance committee members, meetings rather. Um, also due to Councilor McGinty's resignation, uh, we need to schedule a special election. And we have um, a memo here from Deborah Cabana. Would you like to say sure. anything about this? The uh, charter, our cha town charter specifies that if we have a vacancy and it's more than six months, then we do need to uh, schedule a special election if the, spe if the election is more than six months away. Um, and that election now is going to be in November, a year away. Um, the um, municipal election law provides that if you, if you schedule a special election, uh, that you can also determine the shorter time frame period that nomination papers can be available. And that can be as little as 14 days. And um, that they need to be um, filed at least, uh, excuse me, it, it can be as little as 10 days and be filed 14 days before the election. What I'm recommending is that the nomination papers be available until December 10th, that's almost a month, and that a um, special election be scheduled either January 4th or January 11th. Thank you very much. Good. Councilor Fritz. I think January 4th is way too soon a following New Year and the holidays. Even the 11th, I think, is awfully, you know, just people get their focus back into um, thinking about um, other issues besides the holidays. Um, is there any reason we can't have another a week later? I mean, this person would come on the council for the February meeting. They could still do it if the election were 18. I so believe two weeks. Um, the first of the year. I believe the next weekend after the 11th. I, I personally am in favor of the 11th, but I believe the next. Monday is Martin Luther King Day, which would make the Tuesday the day after a long weekend, and I, which would mean, I would think, you might have to put it off another week, and I think we're really getting too far out. So I, I, I personally think the 11th would be better. The 4th seems too close. That's, that's the long weekend of being reversed in New Year's Day. So. But yeah, I, I would agree that following the Tuesday following a holiday would not be good either. Getting people. Okay. Yeah. I, I see nodding, but I didn't know. Councilor Lynch. Okay. And um, if we did it on the 11th, we could perhaps move our regular January meeting to later in the month, so that we could have a January meeting and a full council. I think that would be good. I know okay. Councilor Roberts was mentioning. Just when we were chatting before the meeting, he mentioned if we had the election on the 11th, that we ha we have all of us have on our schedules a workshop scheduled for the 13th, which is the Wednesday, two days afterwards, 
um, and so that perhaps that would be a good day for the council meeting if we already right. have it on our calendars and I know Councilman Roberts chooses 11 to 12 is on the Wednesday oh I'm sorry yes I got I was off the date so it would be the 12th yeah. it would be the 12th but in any event you have a, a conflict for the next Monday for council meeting anyways and that would in any event that would allow the um, sorry, the new councilor to attend the January meeting yeah. I'm sorry, I missed when you were talking about holding the conference. Is it 17th? If? Wednesday the 12th. Wednesday the 12th, the day after the election. Oh, uh, oh. The potential day after the election. It would be the Wednesday. But we have that, I believe I looked on my calendar, we have that Wednesday, because the counselors have that Wednesday that we know we're free that evening, because it's, well, we should know, because we have a, a workshop scheduled for that evening. So. Do we have a motion? Would you like a motion? Sure. Okay. I would like to move that we set a special election for Tuesday, January 11, 2005, for town council, for the chair vacated by Councilor John McGinty, that we have the nomination papers available starting tomorrow through December 10, 2004, and that we move the January Town Council meeting to Wednesday, January 12th. Second. Succinctly put, thank you. Um, I seconded that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? No? All in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, um, I have one question, though. I, I, uh, do we have to vote on this last line? It said consideration could also be given as to whether paper ballots are used and the results hand counted in lieu of using tabulating machines, or is that just a decision left to the clerk? I discussed this with the clerk today, and we'll be back next month with a warrant for the election that spells out all of those details. Okay. Okay, great. Um, if anyone has any input on those issues for clerk beforehand, feel free to let her know. Okay. Um, Mr. Mr. Manager? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask the council to entertain to suspend the rules to take up an item out of order. And what that item is, is I received a phone call late last week after the agenda was prepared from David Weatherby, who was the chairman of the Beach to Beacon Road Race. And they would like to have the road race back on Saturday, uh, the first Saturday in August, which is August 6th and they'd like to get going in, in planning the race and getting the word out, getting the date on their website and all those different things. Uh, remember this past year was Sunday for what we told to be one year only. So they'd like to get back to Saturday, August 6th, and I would appreciate if the council would consider suspending the rules to take up an item out of order to, uh, do, to do that so that the planning for that major event can begin to occur. Do I hear a motion to suspend the rules? Move? Yes. The move and second it, all in favor? It's unanimous to suspend the rules. Do I hear a motion to have a new item, item number 70? Um, deal with this question of the date. Beach to Beacon. I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, I move that the council approve the date of Saturday, August 6, 2005, for the seventh annual Beach to Beacon 10K road race. You're just showing off that you know that. <laughs> a second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Nope. All in favor? Uh, Council, yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, we have a moment now for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. I see no one coming forward. I just want to briefly, uh, I worked with Councilor McGinty for nine years, and while we disagreed often, uh, he, was, he was always very dedicated to his work, always seemed very well prepared, and, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, gave his all to serving as a member of the town council, and uh, I wish him well. I'm sure we all wish him well, and, and we all, on behalf of the council, thank him for his work and service to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I would like to just mention for the public, we are having the council, the council is having a workshop on Wednesday 
and that workshop topic it has to do with the Goddard Mansion at Fort Williams. We received a report about that last month. And then there will also be a meeting, a meeting of the Portland Headlight Trustees, which is a separate entity, but is the trustees are the counselors. Um, so we will be having both meetings um, at 7.30 on Wednesday. And there is a question about the location of this meeting, counselors. When originally proposed, we thought we might be able to have the meeting at 4 p.m. so that we could go actually take a look at the Goddard Mansion, but 4 p.m. did not work for everybody's schedule, so we had to put it at 7.30. At 7.30, it will be dark, so I don't think we are going to really be able to go out and look around at the Goddard Mansion at that hour. So a million and a half watts uh, are right to uh, <laughs> flashlight. I should have light. known. I should have known. <laughs> um, where do you want to have it? Here, or we could. The other option is to have it out where, Mike, at the, at the headlight. Lighthouse. Here, light. here at the lighthouse. Is anybody? I'd be inclined to let us trot our little feet out there sometime between now and the meeting and take a look at the mansion ourselves and have the meeting here, especially since the appointments committee has a list of interviews set up in the afternoon just prior to that meeting. Is that the, we're not voting on this, but is that okay with everybody? Okay, so the meeting will be here at Town Hall. Well, not here in this room, up in the conference, I assume the conference room is there? In, in the Town Hall somewhere. Hopefully the conference room, but come find us if you need to. Okay, do I hear a motion for adjournment? Mm -hmm. so, that, did, <laughs> that was a pretty serious second over there. So moved and seconded. All in favor of adjourning? It's unanimous. Thank you very much, everyone. Mike Mansion the Council, the yeah. Goddard Mansion repairs, the emergency ones to authorize are in fact underway. Uh, the fence thing we were putting up today, the press herald <coughs> was photographing it. And the <coughs> masonry bid came in less than anticipated. Oh, that's so uh, in, as did the fencing. So uh, we're about five thousand under the amount that you authorized for the emergency repairs that need to be done.